This episode of Capes and Lunatics is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. This is Luca Perk, and you're listening to the Capes and Lunatics podcast. The recording has started. Hello and welcome once again to Super Connectivity. I'm your host, Charlie, the Professor Esser. And with me, as always, is the blue-eyed bomber from the Burger Pits. Phil, Phil, me and Parrish. Welcome back, Phil. Welcome back to Super Connectivity, the only show on TV where all the connections are always super. Oh, and, uh... What's going on in the world today, Philip? Let's see here. I was going to say, um, you sent me a list. Uh, I sent you a list. I checked it twice. Uh, let's talk. Uh, oh, let's talk Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Okay. Because this is something. So uh, Netflix has hired Takeo Watiti to create a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory series, which is Wasn't it two, interesting. Isn't it two series? Well, it's two se- Yes, it is. I'm getting to that. Sorry. Fill up. You oh, said what? Always stomping on my, stomping on my big lead. So the, so what everyone is, is, is kind of geeked about is that he's going to be interpreting, this will be our third, I believe it's a live action interpretation of, um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, uh, by Takio Watiti. Now, I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm excited about it. Um, you know, who amongst us, here's what I, here's what I, here's what I like the best about it, because it's going to be a series, I get the feeling that they're going to give us, I don't think they're going to give us, like, more backstory, per se, into the people, but I think we're going to get more answers to old questions that we've always had. So, for example, so this is a free line, because I came up with this line today, you know, where someone's going to call out Wonka for Augustus falling into the chocolate and say, you told him he could eat anything in this room. Says, yes, I told him he could, but I didn't say he should. Oh. And I think that's the kind of a, of a line that could set this into a really neat way, answer some age-old questions about what's going on with all this, get us not so much backstory, but just sort of, anticipate the kind of questions that people always ask about these shows and really sort of give some decent answers to these questions. Coming as like the third adaptation, there's a lot of fan questions out there. And if you put it into a TV series format, I think it's going to give you a lot of story. The next thing they're doing, the next thing that Takeo Atiti is, is doing, which to me is the most interesting, is he's going to do a series centered on the Oompa Loompas. Mm. Presumably the Oompa Loompas in Loompa Land and the difficulties of living in Loompa Land. Now, of course, good night. Uh, Takeo Watiti, you know, he's very big on, um, you know, uh, indigenous peoples, uh, the struggles of indigenous peoples, the employment of indigenous peoples. So I do wonder how the very colonial... Wonka is going to get played in Ataki, uh, in Ataki Watiti's uh, storyline, especially when we get to the Oompa Loompas. You know, um, how that story is going to be examined and broken down. And I do think that this will be, my prediction, the Oompa Loompas will be uh, Netflix's Mandalorian. Oh. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be breaking out this expanded universe uh, beloved characters, but not characters you know. So it's beloved character types, but not the actual characters you know. And that's, I think, what makes The Mandalorian so good, is that it does take place in a universe that we're familiar with without actually being about stuff we've already seen a dozen times before and characters we've seen a dozen times before. It's all new characters that are disarmingly familiar. And I think that's what... Uh, the Oompa Loompas could be for a franchise story with Netflix. So, do you? That's exciting. Do you think we could get some kind of prequel where we see how Willy Wonka starts the factory? I mean, that's a possibility. I mean, you know, I'm assuming that the that the main series is going to be the books. No, 
which is, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Charlie and the Glass, or Willy Wonka, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate, Fa- no, Charlie and the Chocolate, Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka and the Great Glass Elevator. Um, uh, cause that's the easiest spot to get blood from. Yes. What? No, because that has all, all kinds of bones in it. But the neck is fairly unguarded, and it has uh, too big the uh, the aortic uh, blood vessel and the uh, carotid blood vessel. So, yeah, it would be very painful. So anyway, yes, that's a good thing. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so that's so that's an interesting question: is how is Taki going to evolve? Mm-hmm this universe you know it's it's one of these interesting things because i think sometimes you have these universes that are from self-contained stories and people are afraid like the mandalorian to go off off the off the premise of of the pre-existing universe you know Mm -hmm. to say well what if we just talk about things that don't happen to you know the skywalker family and people they know and it gets to be a really interesting story uh, because they can take risks, and nothing is taken for granted. And the idea of a series um, of, about the Oompa Loompas really intrigues me, because we're going to get to see who the Oompa Loompas are, because, let's face it, the Oompa Loompas have no characterization in the previous movies. Hmm. So now we're going to actually find out who the Oompa Loompas are, why the Oompa Loompas are the way the Oompa Loompas are, and what they believe. And I also like the idea, because I think... I, I imagine Taki Waititi is going to cast uh, short actors for that. And because short actors do need work, uh, I very much support the idea of having a series about an island of short people and hiring a bunch of short actors to play in that. And that would be really awesome, in my humble opinion. Oh, yeah. You know. So, and that's that's what's coming from Netflix soon. That's that's what Taki Waititi is doing now. And for what it's worth, I I like the fact that Disney is letting their talent, you know, go explore other things and other studios. You know, they're not. I mean, they're actors; they hold the contract with an iron fist. But directors and writers, are like, nah, you go have fun over in that other 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 place and other universe. You know. We're not going to make that story, but you know what? Maybe someone else will make it. And, you, and if you, as long as you come back and do your work for us, you guys can make however however many other films you want in other places as well. Um, and that's a nice thing about Disney that I've I found that is very unusual, but also kind of cool. I mean, do you think that's how they get a lot of the big name actors, or they're just like, oh yeah, hey, go 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 play? But when it's time, you know, just come back. You know, got a spot for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, for the actors too, you know, although, again, like I said, they're, they're a little more controlling of what their actors do. Yeah. You know? You think um, that's because they're, they're more, like, the actors are, like, more the face of the company, the directors, you yeah. know, they don't see. Yeah. And, and it's not that they can't do other films, it's that, you know, they can't be other superheroes, as, as, okay. as an example, you know? Yeah. Um, but speaking of superheroes, that does bring us to, we got some interesting stills from Loki. Yes. And so one of the biggest things people are talking about with Loki is that we catch this glimpse of this woman all dressed in green with a little gold necklace that looks very Asgardian. And there's a couple of theories as to who this girl may be. Um, One theory, of course, is that it's Lady Loki. Uh, another theory that was put out uh, by Grace Randolph was that this could be the Enchantress. Ooh. Yes. Now, you know, of course, obviously, not to be that guy, it's like, well, gee, doesn't the Enchantress usually show a heck of a lot more cleavage than that? Uh, <laughs> but hey, man, it's not about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, that's interesting. But actually, there's a third character. I haven't heard yet that might be a really interesting character to introduce in the Loki series where it has been suggested we will get Lady Loki and uh, Kid Loki and that is the character of Leah, Hela's handmaid. Wow. And the idea that there'd be this other character in there who is 
in many ways a creation of Loki's, who is also Hela, who is also, because of course it's the Time Variance Authority, so we are going to be doing that time travel nuttery um, and alternate timeline stuff. I, I think that might be an interesting thing to introduce Leia into that story as this counterbalance to Loki. Because, of course, if you will recall, she was always kind of Loki's straight man mm-hmm. um, in the old Kid Loki series. So, And having her sort of an aged-up version of her, who isn't Hela, but also isn't... Uh, is something else kind of that strikes me as a really interesting idea that they might be exploring because they do like to explore new things over there at Disney. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, what if it is Loki's daughter? Because I mean, in the comics, I don't know if it still is, but Hela was his daughter for the longest time. So yeah, what are, I mean, well, that, well, that if- was that was that was how the, that that was the the whole reason for introducing Leia in the Kid Loki series was to sort of close that that time circle. Mm-hmm. Where they had Leia be Loki's daughter, but only sort of because he sort of spoke her into existence by telling her story, and she becomes Hela. Because mm. that's and that's why Hela could be an adult when Loki and Thor were younger, even though uh, even though Hela is technically supposed to be Loki's daughter. Yes. So it's a very nice little way that they they looped it back around, which of course fits in perfectly with a Time Variance Authority story. So that's nice. Plus, I wonder too, if, like if you do the daughter, if, you know, you know, if, uh, eventually if Tom Hiddleston gets uh, wants to leave, it's like, oh, we don't have Loki, but we have the daughter of Loki. Mm-hmm. Well, exactly. You know, there's all there's a lot of things they can do here. Has been suggested they might introduce Kang. Um, an interesting theory I have heard that uh, Owen Wilson may become Kang by the end of it. Ooh. Um, I don't know if that's true, but I could see it. Uh, people say that the person standing lo- next to Loki in that scene with Loki in his suit, in his Time Variance Authority suit, and then the Time the time Variance Authority like troopers running around them, that the guy in the hood is, is Luke Wilson, that that could be the guy who becomes ha- Kang. Would be really interesting if they call him Nathaniel Richards. Ooh. You know, so honestly, I think the Time Variance Authority is a really interesting concept and characters, and you know, we're all excited to see where it goes from here. You, you know, but, uh, you, you know what I I heard somebody well, was it on a podcast or something, but a, a theory they're probably not going to do this, but you know, it would be, be uh, an awesome way to introduce the Fantastic Four if Loki's jumping through time if he does something that affects their their flight. So they act, they get like thrown into the cosmic, or you know, he changes history. So there wasn't a Fantastic Four before, but now he uh, alters their course, so they hit the cosmic <laughs> rays. Well, that would be interesting. That would be a very interesting way to introduce mutants and the Fantastic yes. Four into everything. You know, suddenly, then you know, back in 1968, it brings them into the story. I mean, anything's possible. It would be interesting to see, and it would be a neat way to play with that and we get to see where that leads you know we know that you know time every time you change the timeline it just creates a new one so it might be hard to explain how that that universe is our is the mcu main universe that we see you know but like i but like i always say everyone thinks they're in the 616 until they're not anymore (laughs) you know it's like, oh, wait, we're not the six sisters, which is the weirdest thing about, like, the naming of universes, because you know that everybody thinks their universe is, is like, the main, the main iteration. I mean, um, unless, unless Loki's aware enough to be able to, you know, know which universe he's in and able to jump between them or something. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see how the Time Variance Authority works in this universe. Um, if they are... You know, it's sort of that kind of question: like, are are they going to be acting like the Voyagers? If those who remember the old Voyager series, where they have to set right the things in history that have gone wrong, um, because things things aren't happening the way they're supposed to because of various other factors, and Loki's got to go back in time and fix them, um, or if Loki's just bit in charge of cleaning up his own mess. Um, <laughs> Which is arguably the whole thing, which is like, you know, you brought you, you brought the first, you know, uh, Infinity Stone to Earth, 
and that's when ev- that that's when everything started to go nuts. Um, and the big thing, you're you're supposed to be dead. Now you're not dead. You want to earn this new life. Um, <laughs> clean up your mess. Yeah. Well, you know, it's always it'll always be very interesting, especially you know, it's always that big question as to why the Tesseract wound up on Earth. Mm. I've always thought that actually was Loki, that Loki had stolen it and placed it on Earth. And I do think Loki was whispering in uh, Red Skull's ear to let him know where it was, because otherwise, how else would he know? Yes, Tristan, what? What did you just notice? Oh, uh, well, because cause, uh, Iron Man told him. Well, yeah, that happened off screen. Iron Man, anything that someone knows that they weren't there for, you can assume that someone told them. But speaking of the Hulk, <laughs> Mark Ruffalo is in negotiation to join the cast of the She-Hulk series. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, and I find that interesting on a couple different levels. Like, on one level, it is just the question of, is he going to be, you know, when Mark Ruffalo joins, is he going to be, is he going to be Mark Ruffalo? What is it? I it, mean, is, is he going to be the Hulk as a ongoing character in the series? You th- I, or is I, he going to be like just in like the pilot or something? I was going to say, do you think he's, it's so, you know, he could be there in the pilot to give her the blood transfusion and then maybe show up in the season one finale or whatever, you know, something like that. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting. What, I, I think one of the biggest questions for me is, is he going to be in that Hulk mode? Mm. And are they going to tell a story about the Hulk dealing with dealing with things? Because, you know, one thing that we can say about Professor Hulk, which this, this character is very much based on, is that as Doc Samson pointed out, he wasn't really the merging of no. He just thought he was the two. He was yeah, but that he just sort of realized that Banner's problems went way deeper than he could help, and he just had to. And he just figured, found the least offensive version yeah. oh. of the Hulk to put in charge. Oh yeah, because years later, yeah, when Banner goes into his psyche and sees all these other Hulks, Professor Hulk's there, and he's like, "Wait a minute." Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the idea. Um, so. It's an interesting question, um, how they're going to explore uh, the Hulk, how they're going to explore that story. I mean, what that story is going to be is always a big thing. They have suggested that it is going to be comedic in origin, in its nature, that the nature is going to be relatively comedic, um, which could be good, uh, especially for She-Hulk, because she does. She is a character with a lot of comic chops, yes. and... Um, but then, if you do bring in the Hulk, is that going to subvert that? And are we going to get real deep stories in the comedy as well? That's why I'm thinking they're not going to have a lot of Ruffalo. He'll be like maybe in the first episode and the last one in the season. Yeah, you know, he's not, I don't think he's going to be there every episode. Yeah, well, you know, but I am I am curious because I can I can see a universe in which they do a lot of humor, but that is going to have. It's sort of in the way that I think like a lot of shows have done in recent years where they open with a lot of gags and then like halfway through you go, oh, wow, there's something deep and poignant going on. I do want to find out if they're going to um, – oh, I'm blanking on his name now. The guy who played Doc, Doc Samson. Um, oh, Ty, was it Ty Burrell or whatever? Yeah, Ty Burrell. I really want to see if they're going to bring in Ty Burrell. That is my hope for this, you know. I hope they bring back the leader. Like I said, I, 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 I can really imagine a cool merging of the Modoc character and the leader character where his head has just gotten so big he has to fly around in the chair. <laughs> you know? So if you remember the way that uh, Hank Pym's first wife had, who had the brain expansion, sort of like sitting in the chair and having the gigantic brain being fed by stuff. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that would be interesting. But that's the other thing that's going on over. Well, that's one of the many things, and this is this is of course is the thing that of course Rob was complaining about. That even though Disney has created a bunch of stuff and had a huge hit with the Mandalorian, and you know I think you know people have are, are watching that Jeff Goldblum show, <laughs> and of course all of the you know re, the, the nostalgia, you know Teen Disney reboots. And there's a new one that I really want to want to see, and um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like, you know, 
but the kid, uh, I don't know, there's a new, like, kid, kid, super intelligent, cynical kid, wacky adventure story on there that, um, oh, man, I'm, try- I'm trying to remember what the name, but it's like, you know, Ted. Wait. You know, Wait, the uh, new- uh, are you talking about Artemis Fowl? No, not Artemis Fowl, no. That's the one everyone's mad about, because I guess he's, they made him too good in it. No, it's called, um, uh, I can't remember it now. But anyway, no, it's not Artemis Fowl, because it's, it's like a kid who's, like, thinks everyone, he's, it, like, it's over, he's speaking with his school guidance counselor because he believes that, you know, there are spies after him or something like that. Okay. And... Yeah, it's just it seems wacky and fun, but it also might be poignant and, and deep. And that's that is very much my wheelhouse. So Disney has a lot of shows out there, but they don't have any real Marvel presence aside from the movies and the already ran TV series. And annoyingly, they haven't put the shorts on there, which is the one thing I really thought they would have put on is all of the all of the Marvel shorts. From the TV series, I mean, maybe eventually, because I or mean, from the from the movie uh, Blu-rays, yeah, because I mean, maybe eventually, because do they not have all the Marvel movies up there already? I mean, I really wasn't mm. looking because I have most of them because I just saw the other day they're like, oh, Black Panther's on there. I was like, was it not on there from the beginning? Um, there were a few because there were a few that were still tied up with rights that had been uh, given to other streaming services. So there were a few that Netflix, as an example, still had the rights to. And, you know, and they have, and, you know, for what it's worth, they have to decide who goes on Hulu and who goes on on Netflix and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, but, yeah, I, I do think that Marvel is getting ready. And I think what's going to happen is when they do drop their Marvel stuff, which is actually relatively soon, because I think what, what we said that... Um, Black Widow was in May, and Winter Soldier drops, or uh, no, uh, Falcon and uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier and drops the, before that, or just after that. No, um, well, Black Widow is May, I think. Falcon and Winter Soldier is August, I think. Okay, yeah. So you know, I mean, yeah, it's it's a while before we get anything, which is annoying. Yeah. Unless WandaVision comes first. No, uh, no, Falcon that's Winter like the, the first, towards the yeah. end of the year, I think. Yeah. You know, and. You know, they could have shot the whole thing beforehand and had a show, had the show ready. But I think once we actually start having these shows drop, they are going to accelerate. I yeah. think that – because really it just came out this year, you know, and there was a lot of catch-up with stuff. And they put in one new show, which was The Mandalorian. Um, well, one big new show because, again, like I said, they have, they've had new shows since the beginning. They've had um, – you know, they had the Jeff Goldblum show. Then they had all of the Disney Vault stuff that people hadn't seen in years, like Black Hole, which wrote, blew my mind to see Black Hole again. Um, so there's a lot there. There is a lot there that uh, Disney had for us to wade through before they started dropping our Marvel shows. But that's the thing they've been holding out on us. Because they know it's the thing we all want. Yeah, and two, I mean, it's not like it's not even like Disney Universe. I mean, at least uh, at Disney, even you know, if they didn't have a lot of new stuff, there's so much old stuff on there yeah. that it's not like oh, there's nothing on there. Exactly. There's there's tons. Now I will admit I haven't watched it that much, but then again, I don't watch Netflix that much either. Yeah. You know, it's like you know I don't really I don't watch that much of my streaming services. Mostly, what I watch is regular TV. Yeah. 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 You know, regular TV, uh, literally regular TV, like over-air broadcast TV for me TV, decades, and all the old people shows. And then I go on, you know, when I when I get my Direct TV now, uh, or sorry, my AT and T TV now, it's mostly just watching ABC, CBS, and NBC, and then MSNBC when I'm feeling saucy. <laughs> you know, I barely watch HBO. Yeah. So. But we'll see how HBO Max comes out. Oh, but 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 speaking of HBO, uh, did you want to talk about that Watchmen thing? Oh, so it was an interesting thing uh, with Watchmen. So we've actually gotten the numbers on Watchmen, and it did not do very well. Apparently, um, it was huge in the Nerdiverse, but its actual share, like its actual Nielsen numbers, were not as impressive as people thought. For as much as it was in the conversation and zeitgeist. And do you just think, I mean, 
I think they could have promoted it better. And two, it is on HBO, so it's kind of behind the paywall. And do you think? Well, yeah. Uh, do you I mean, think it's absolutely behind the paywall? So they're, but you know, they I, compared to other. And, and do you, and do you think like now that we're in like in the world of like all these streaming platforms, is HBO kind of getting left behind with all these streaming platforms? Because if someone's going to pay for something like these days, don't you think they're going to go for a streaming platform over HBO? Well, except that you know, first off, you don't even pay for HBO. Well, you kind of do. HBO I, tends to get bundled into whatever cable package you have. Uh, you sometimes for package. a while. After a while, you have to pay for extra for it because I pay extra for it every month. Well, I mean, for, for AT&T, who owns HBO, for AT&T now, you actually get it just wrapped into it. Oh, so. Well, I have direct TV, so, yeah, and I still got to pay for it. Yeah, well, I don't know. Um, but I'm just saying, I just, I don't know if like the, the streaming services are kind of hurting HBO. I don't know. I mean, well, I mean, it's lots, lots of things, but what I really wanted to talk about is how HBO or Netflix or any of these shows, they don't need you to watch them all the time. No. They just need you to pay to have the ability to watch them. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, I'm paying for, right now, um, I pay for HBO, because that is rolled into my yeah. um, my ATT Now package. Um, so I'm, I'm paying for HBO, I'm paying for Hulu, I'm paying for Netflix, I'm paying for um, Disney Plus, uh, and yet, you know, what I mostly spend my time on are Tubi, which I don't pay for, and YouTube, which I don't pay for. Yeah. So, as an ironic twist of fate, that's that's the real truth of it, you know, that I don't actually, because, and this is something that actually you look at. Uh, so was, oh, uh, Matt Pat was doing a whole analysis of what people watch in streaming, and they says really the biggest streaming platform is YouTube. Oh yeah, of course it's you free. know that people spend hours on YouTube in a way that they don't do with other shows and other streaming services. Well, because I mean, one, I mean, unless you pay for the extra stuff, I mean, it's the basic thing is free. And two, not only is there like shows on there, but it's like, you know, oh, let me see if I can find a video about how to, you know, play the guitar or do this or do that, you know. Yeah. And they were also talking about um, YouTube TV, Mm -hmm. which is a $50 a month service that gives you live streaming TV as well. Yes. Like broadcast over the air stuff. And um, similar to what I have with my ATT, ATT TV now, which also has. Yeah broadcast shows and things like that. I think that. a lot of them do that too because like with the eight, with the CBS All Access, you you can live stream your local CBS on that too. Yeah, um, and you know, and you're paying for it, so why not, you yeah. know? And one that live television experience actually does have there believe it or not as as it turns out despite everyone going, "Oh, streaming and curated content." Sometimes you don't want to think that much about what you watch on TV. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you literally just want to just turn it on, leave it on. Yeah. Know that it's a channel that you can watch. You know it's going to have this kind of programming on it, and YouTube is great for that. Tubi is great for that. You know, because I put on you know um, uh, Mar- uh, Mary Jo on, on on the riff tracks, and I'm listening to uh, that. That's uh, MST3K thing. Well, riff tracks. It's a evolved from that with um, oh, I'm blanking on the other girls. Um, Mary Jo and Mike Nelson's wife. I can't remember her name now. But anyway, um, yeah, and they're they're hilarious, and they make fun of the old sh- movies, and I like it. And I'll fall asleep to that and wake up, like, you know, two hours later, and there's another one on, and I'm That's just right. watching that. But, uh, but no, but like, back to the whole Watchmen thing, it's like, I like the original stuff they did with this series, but, like... <laughs> Do you think maybe did they overestimate the popularity of the franchise in general? No, because that's the thing. I don't think they really expected it to be a ratings hit. That's the thing. You don't need it to be a ratings hit. Oh, no, no. You need it to be... And to be fair, you know... I mean, HBO doesn't... HBO. HBO doesn't need it to be a giant hit, but don't you think Warners and DC wanted it to be a big hit? Not if you're paying for it. That's the thing. It's not so much that they don't need a hundred million people to watch the show. Oh, nothing gets a hundred million anymore. Except- well, yeah, but but that's the thing. It's Well, that's the thing. It's a fragmented audience to start with. What they need is they need to have you know 
that HBO is something worth buying because they have good shows, even if these are not necessarily shows you are watching. Yeah, but I'm, so but I mean, like wh- they have the what, what was it Avenue Five or something, which is looks funny, looks delightful. I've watched a couple episodes; it is funny. I haven't really gotten back and watched more of it. Yeah, I couldn't tell you. you. Know, they have a lot of shows on there that I, I like and I would like to watch. But I never get around to it. Same thing with Netflix. A lot of shows I like, I would like to watch, but I never get around to it. And then they, they just said, that's fine. Get, as soon as you just come to it whenever you want, we'll just keep taking your money. I mean, I couldn't tell you, yeah, what any, regu- any uh, regular series that are on HBO right now. But And I know it was, like, it was always supposed to be like a limited thing, but do you th- I, I don't know. I just got the impression that they wanted Watchmen while it was on to do Game of Thrones numbers. I mean, that's the thing. I think that, well, you always want it to do Game of Thrones. They would have been very happy if it did have those kinds of ratings. But I think that it accomplished what it needed to do. Yeah. It showed they can make really good new programming that they're not just Game of Thrones, that they can do more than one show and more than one kind of show and more than one genre. And I think that is what they, that is what they wanted to do. And I think that is what they did. You know, and again, remember, this was, again, a, a, a product that technically Warner Brothers already owned. Yeah. So their licensing deal is not that bad. So they can really look at obscure properties. Heck, I would not be surprised if we did not get a House of Mystery horror anthology series on HBO Max with Cain and Abel. I would love to see Cain and Abel on that. I will audition for Abel. I don't know. I think me and Lil. It was the portly one. I think Lil Lil and I have talked about this before. They if they bring back like a constant team. They should do it on HBO. I mean, you could do all the nudity and gore and violence and you know. Oh sure, you know stuff. if that's what you're into, yeah, you, you can definitely do that, and and it's an option for them. And that's the thing. And again, they they don't need to because as an example, Netflix of course never releases ratings because they never have any ratings. You know, they, they really don't. And they don't need to have ratings because all they need to know is they need to know that people will pay money to have access to it. And to me, that's what DCU's problem was. Yeah. Is it didn't have strong, compelling shows that unless you were a DC fan. Yeah. I don't think there was an impetus to want to sit down with DC for that for the money you're going to spend, even though that was like the cheapest of all services, except for the free ones, but you get what you pay for. And just the, and they started off with the first season of Titans, which even like hardcore Titans fans, I think a lot of them were turned off by that first season. I mean, they turned it or kind of turned it around in the second season, but like, but then when they get to like Doom Patrol, which isn't as known, I think like the expect, you know, there weren't as many expectations for Doom Patrol and stuff. Yeah. But, so. And Doom Patrol was actually quite good. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's you know, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, here's the thing. I may come back to DCU at some point because um, I didn't dislike their shows. But the thing was is that when it came down to it, I was like, am I going to come back here? Yeah. Is there enough content on this thing that I want to go wander it? Like, for example, you know, like my wife, she'll put on Netflix and she'll start finding the cooking shows and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, love the cooking shows myself. Um, you know, we like the, the competition dessert shows. We're going to make this. And then they make it and it's fun and it's delightful. Um, you know, and DCU, I don't think it's a, a, a thing you can wander in the way that you really can wander in Disney+. Plus. Yeah, I know. Really, you really can wander in Netflix. But it's like, and again, DC, DC Universe is like all DC super, I mean, there's a whole bunch of older TV shows, but it's all superheroes. Disney Plus, it's all the Marvel stuff, it's Star Wars, it's all the yeah. animated stuff. It's And and to be fair, you know, all of the old shows that they're showing on there, it's like, you know, these weren't hits, maybe for some reason sometimes, you know? Because yeah, it's nice to have them and you get that nostalgic feel for it, but you know, again, unless you were a Captain Marvel fan, the 1970s Shazam series isn't necessarily something that's going to make you go, oh yeah, that's what I want to see, you know? Um, just because, it, it just isn't. And, you know, that's, that's 
something that's an interesting aspect of it. So, you know, ways you can look at it, ways that you can break it down. But I think from a streaming platform's perspective, you wanna you you want your reputation more than you want your shows. You want people to know this is a, this is the place you go to to find good shows. Because not everyone's going to watch every good show when it comes out. Not everyone's going to be appointment viewing. And really, for something like Watchmen, that might even be their central thought on it. It's like, people don't have to tune in. We're not doing, you know, first date drops, even first date plus seven. We're doing, this exists, this is a great show, people can come back to, people can come and watch it more than once. You know, they can really play with it as a streaming model. Mm-hmm. And that and Westworld, they, they, they're they building themselves up. Again, shows I would love to watch, but I never do. But to me, I can see how it would be worth it to hold on to it because I know those shows are there. At least that's my opinion on that, you know. Um, ah, the streaming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one last thing to talk about with streaming is uh, Gaston and Lafoe. Oh, yeah. getting their own series. Uh, I'm I'm excited about that. We don't know much about it yet, except that you know uh, it is the actors from the live action coming back to reprise their roles, and this is going to be kind of a prequel. So this is before Gaston meets. But I think we're going to get some really great evolution of the character of Gaston. You know, which is kind of one of those weird things. We're actually because we know we had to put him into that jerk by the end of it. So seeing what his tale is up until that point will be very interesting. But I do get the feeling we're going to get that there's more nuance to his jerkiness. That then if we go rewatch the Beauty and the Beast live action, which I never have, we we'll say, oh, I see what, what's going on here, and I see why he has these issues. And you know, but at the same time, it's going to be you know Rosencrantz and Guildenstern never meeting Hamlet. It's going to be fun. It's going to be just two two lovable guys wandering around Europe. Having adventures together, and uh, you know, one of them at least falling in love. So that'll be lovely. Okay, Philip. Um, um, I know I know it's late. I know you're tired, but do you, did you want to talk uh, Daredevil? The issue. We Daredevil? can talk Daredevil real quick. Um, I did enjoy that. Um, yeah, I thought it was a really good redemption to this whole arc. Yeah. Where he realized, you know, so the plot line is... And, again, aspects I don't like about it is, like, oh, the cops won't go into Hell's Kitchen. And I don't even know what's going on with that. I don't even know who's in charge of that anymore. But just the idea that, yeah, you know, oh... I mean, it's where it is. Do you think it's like, you know? a, it's like you know, like a Gotham thing? It's like, oh, the city's so corrupt. I, I mean, I think yeah, it's the strong. Except it's the, not. The strong, you know, that's the thing. It's the, the strong winds are paying people off, and you know they're trying to mess with the kingpin crew. Which I mean, did you see the cover for next issue? I think it's you know it's going to be Matt and Fisk teaming up to you know take down the strong winds or whatever. Yeah, um, and yeah, and that, and that's and that's fine. But you know, at the end of the day, when he goes and he puts on the mask. Yes. You know, from the one daredevil who fell, and he's, you know, going to now beat up, you know, uh, Bullseye with his 99 cent store daredevil mask, which is in its own way kind of cool. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's good. I, I like it. It's, it's a lot of fun. And also, it makes you think, and it really moves you because, like I said, the idea that daredevil is more than, it's more than me. It's a symbol, you know, and I, you know, I tarnished the Daredevil, but these people have paid for my sins, you know, kind of bringing it all back. And that, that was, that was lovely. I mean, I, I like that Chip Zdarsky's taking the whole journey because there's like, it seems like a lot of writers, they like, starting with like Frank Miller in the 80s, all, you know, through Bendis and everyone else. It just seems like a lot of writers, like, they want to dr- see how far down they can pull Matt Murdock and drag him through the mud but a lot of them don't bring him back up you know a lot of times they don't bring him yeah. back up at least chips of darsky's tr- doing a whole journey he brought him down but he's bringing him back up because this well, is yeah it's, it gotta give the hero a good redemption arc that, that's yeah. that's important you know yeah which a lot of a lot of people don't seem to want to do with matt murdoch they just want to kind of keep him down there in the dirt but like i said yeah zadarsky seems like he's taking him on the full journey so well that's sucky um really want to real quick talk about dr doom oh 
um, Kang and, and Doom on a road trip, which is fun. <laughs> they kill a lot of people. Like, just straight up murdering people left and right. Uh... Including this this really lovely like little hobo man, this nice little hobo who like scurries up the train. He's some old guy. He's clearly weathered and he's gone through a lot and all this kind of stuff. And it says, "Hey, gents, do you mind if I share this car box car with you?" Because of course, you know, Doom and uh, Doom and uh, King are riding the rails. Um, and they like literally uh, shoot the guy out of it. Like he's not he doesn't live through that. That that's not that's I mean it's played for laughs, but like oh he probably died, didn't he? Uh <laughs> later they murder two rednecks who made fun of their costumes. Um and you know, to be fair, um why are you making fun of people in costumes in a universe where people have laser eyes? And who doesn't know Doctor Doom in the Marvel universe? Yes. Yeah. Well, but, oh, Dr. Doom all the way out here? Didn't he die in New York last week or something like that? I heard yeah. something on the news. Anyway, but, um... Again, I mean, it, they again, murder, it can always be... they murder those guys. Yeah, but again, even if you think Doom's dead, it could be a temperamental Doom bot. Well, yeah, it's always a temperamental Doom bot. Yeah. Uh, you know, they take a boat, or they steal a boat, one or the other, uh, and they... They have a lot of back and forth. It's very cute, you know. It's a, like I said, it's a very nice road trip they have. Um, and then uh, Doom basically, you know, of course he's being chased by Paladin, which is I don't know if I want to laugh or cry that Paladin is coming after Doom, but he's is like somehow holding his own against Doom in his own way. Oh, and we get of course the orb. Uh, remember the orb with the oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. have the Watcher. And it's kind of cool because uh, basically this guy, guy who's the courier, drops off the uh, ultimate nullifier for Doom. Because, <laughs> you know, that's just laying around. Uh, <laughs> and Doom can get access to it somehow. Uh, yeah, and th- there's a nice little exchange where Doom is like, you know, you could have opened this case and become the most powerful being in the universe. Like, Eh, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> so like, I do my job. I deliver my packages. I take care of my wife and kids. And, and it's like, and then and then Doom starts talking about his imaginary kids and you know the alternate timeline that he lives in. And uh, then King, you know, after the guy leaves, King basically suck, sucker punches Doom to steal the uh, to steal the um, ultimate nullifier from him. And uh, yeah. Oh, I think he. Uh, oh, he kills Kang there, you know, as you do. And mm-hmm. then we see him riding off on horseback to go reclaim his kingdom. Apparently, he also tells. Uh, oh, he also calls up Reed to tell him how to fix the uh, black hole problem, telling him to send uh, Brashear into the black hole to fill it with negative energy because you know time warps and all that kind of stuff. So, but I did enjoy it despite all of the randomized killing. Um, it was a good book. And, uh, Savage Avengers, uh, we get to see the secret origin of Cullen Goth. Uh, he ate a Sorcerer Supreme once, so. With mayo. Oh. Uh, no. Uh, he ate a Sorcerer Supreme. Yeah, so uh, that was good, too. And Elektra and, uh, and, uh. Doc Stranger currently oh, yeah, fucking up. Savage Avengers, yeah. Yeah, Savage Avengers 11. So that was good. And then they realize, oh, Conan's the person who can kill Cullen Gath. Guess you should go get him again. I like that Doctor Strange is like, oh, I feel kind of bad that I questioned uh, Conan's motives. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Conan's motives is he kills wizards. And he killed Cullen Gath. And that's the thing. It's like, I've killed him before. And like, no one. And that's the weird thing. It's like, no one thought, wait, wait, you killed him before? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he got better, but I killed him, you know? It's like the third time I killed that guy. It's like, wait, maybe he's the guy that can kill Cullen Gath. Doi! I guess I should have thought of that. Well, it's, <laughs> anyway. do- it's, it's Doctor Strange. I think he has a bias. It's like, oh, a magic guy. Well, you should need magic to kill it. No, it's like, no, I just need a big sword. Nope. <laughs> Need a barbarian. 
When in doubt, stab it with a sword. Okay. Uh, that is a lot to talk about this week, Philip. Uh, if people would like to reach out and touch you in a good way, how can they do so? Well, if you would like to write to me, you can always email me, nightwingpdp at gmail.com. On Twitter, I am at NightwingPDP, and remember to write in to us. Hey, got any questions for the man himself here? Uh, email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com. Uh, call the voicemail, 614-382-2737. That's 614-38CAPES. And again, I mean, you can follow Super Connectivity itself on uh, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, yeah, just go to Linktree, L-A-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Capes and Lunatics. You can find all of our links are there. And sports sponsors, Tweaked Audio, Hunt the Killer, Pod Life the Book, and use the Amazon uh, link for Southgate Media Group in the show notes uh, because, believe it or not, these do cost money. So send money to uh, Southgate Media Group. Master Doom demands it. That's right. And, of course, if you'd like to write to me in that old-fashioned email way, we have Miles and Paz wants to do so at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word at gmail.com. And of course, follow me on the Twitter to live tweet things when I feel like it. At Charlie Esther, that's C-H-A-R-L-I-E E-S-S-E-R Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing! All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for connecting with us this week. Please, super connect with us again next. Oh, remind me, next week we actually do have to talk about Ray's father because we forgot to do that this week. But okay. that's for another episode. Tune in to find out how that son of a moisture farmer made good. Oh, okay. I love how you always are, you're always like, I want to do shorter. I want to do like short half hour episodes and you give me a list of topics like that. Oh. Well, because I figure some of these are, you're going to just use for, like, you know, the Batman thing we did over at... Yeah, uh, well, I Cape figure State. Lil's going to have thoughts on that, but, like, some of this stuff, I'm like, oh, there, Charlie's going to want to break this down. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot to do, and that's the end. This week we had a lot of stuff dropped, but we can use it later, too.